So I come to you with a couple of questions. Have you ever lost your phone or keys? How about your wallet? Imagine the feeling of panic when you're about to leave for work and one or more of those items are not where they're supposed to be. Bible Sleuth here. I'm back again, and this time in search of the lost, and more specifically, a lost sheep. And not a golden sheep either. This is the first of a series of parables about the lost found in the Bible. So let's not waste time, grab our map, and head out on our adventure in Luke 15, 1 through 32. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him, and the Pharisees and scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. That is the first of the lost parables. And of course, I have questions. But first, let's go back in time. I remember a long time ago when as a kid hearing a respected Sunday school teacher saying that a shepherd would break a wandering sheep's leg, set it, then carry it on his shoulders and hand feed it until it had mended to teach the sheep not to roam. I was a preteen and since the teacher was well respected and also a rancher by trade, Surely he would have known, right? I have to say that sometimes God does allow things in our lives to correct us. It is scriptural that he disciplines his children. So was this what happened in this parable? One source suggests the earliest that this teaching appeared was in a sermon by William Branham called The Good Shepherd of the Sheep in March of 1957. In support of Branham's teaching, I found one article that suggested if the sheep was a chronic wanderer, Bedouin shepherds might resort to this drastic measure. However, it is rare. The problem with sheep is that they are natural followers. If one sheep strays, it will be leading others. From a spiritual perspective, that is very scary. King David was a shepherd and described his strength in 1 Samuel 17 when he was about to face off with Goliath. He tells how he freed lambs from the jaws of both a lion and a bear. That's amazing. He did give glory to God in aiding him, but even beyond God's help, throughout his life, Feats of renown are attributed to him. Consider 1 Chronicles 11:14. He and Eleazar took a stand in a barley field against the Philistines when the rest of the Israel army fled and the two men wound up winning a great victory. So David was not a wimp by any means. Still, a grown sheep can weigh from 45 to 100 kilograms or 100 to 220 pounds more depending upon the breed. And Jesus didn't say lamb either. Carrying a full-grown sheep on the shoulders is probably the easiest way to carry them, but it would be exhausting too, especially if old Fluffy is a bit puffy. The healing time for such an injury would take several weeks, and even though the idea is plausible, it is probably unlikely. So what does the Bible say? Jesus does not mention correction of the sheep, only that it was found, returned, and rejoiced over. So did the shepherd break the sheep's leg? I don't think he did, but I don't know. I'm also still not satisfied with the mystery of this parable. I need to know more about sheep. So let's head off to the library. The question is, where do we start? What about the nature of sheep? Since they are compared to people so much in the Bible. In an article by Lindsay Davis, she quoted an associate professor, Scott Bodridge, who said, sheep have a low will to live and will succumb to death 
if stressors become too great? Well, that would definitely explain, in part, their vulnerability to predators. Another tendency when frightened is they will run to a group or usually to a corner. I've also read that sheep are more prone to infection than other farm animals, which would not support the notion of breaking a leg for behavior modification. One article I read ranks sheep slightly below pig in intelligence. Pigs are supposedly ranked fifth smartest animals, even smarter than dogs. So if sheep are so smart, why are they accused of being stupid? The stupid reputation may come from how easily they get lost. Come to find out, sheep have a poor sense of direction. They don't have an internal compass. Their vision may attribute to that. Sheep have a 320 degree field of vision compared to humans approximate 180 degrees, but they don't have good depth perception. Aside from that, they do have a keen sense of hearing. So I suppose if you throw all these traits in the mix and top it off with a lot of emotion because they are very emotional animals. Their only defense is to run to a friend. But what if they can't find a friend when they are scared? Instinctual behavior is really what lends to the notion of their lack of intelligence. I read a story of some Middle East shepherds that stopped to take a lunch unaware that the entire large flock strayed to the edge of a cliff and all went over. The first hundred died in the fall but cushioned the fall for the rest. Now that seems kind of stupid, don't you think? But the overwhelming need to stay together overpowered the danger. And the actual stupidity was those failing to keep an eye out, in my opinion. How does that compare to humans? Globally, since 1840, there have been at least 10 mass religious cult suicide massacres until now. That doesn't seem like that many, right? Well, I did say mass, and we're talking about thousands of people that went off the cliff. According to a Rolling Stone article, of all things, the 1978 Jonestown Massacre was the largest number of American civilian casualties in a single event and remained the largest non-natural disaster loss of civilian life in the United States until 9-11. In the Jonestown Massacre, a major theme resonated with the members. It was the strong sense of family that glued them together. They were drawn to it. The hundreds that followed Jones to Guyana were metaphorically following him to the cliff. It wasn't stupid. It was fulfilling the human need for sense of belonging that unfortunately can be disorienting and even blinding. So what about hermits? They isolate themselves from society. Well, many studies on solitary confinement have concluded that long-term solitary confinement has long-term physical and psychological effects on prisoners. I heard a story of two prisoners who were placed in solitary confinement for a period of time and then placed together in a room. They talked non-stop at each other because of the need to have verbal interaction that they had been deprived. Many recent studies were conducted on the physiological effect of the restrictions placed on people during COVID. Conclusions were rather shocking, including significantly elevated numbers of young suicide attempts. So what happens to those who embrace solitary confinement? Well, they lose a sense of self. In many cases, they even self-harm as a means of holding on to self-existence. And we're talking to the point of self-mutilation even to the point of death. Another study I read says, after even a relative brief period of time in such a situation, an individual is likely to descend into a mental torpor or fog. What does that all mean? Humans have been created to interact with each other. We are sheep in need of friends and trusted leaders who we can run to when we hear the roar of a predator. Without hope, we succumb to death easily. Let's go back to the notion of sheep being stupid. We must not forget that Jesus is associated as a lamb. 
John the Baptist recognized this when he said in John 1 29, the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. The apostle John in Revelation reported seeing Jesus in a vision in chapter 5 verses 2 through 6. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures, and among the elders I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. It is an odd picture that the lion of the tribe of Judah looked like a slain lamb with the horns and eyes and such, right? I believe we can see the irony of God's kingdom in this. 1 Corinthians 1, 27 through 29 says, God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. So why sheep? Why a lamb? Well, as I mentioned, sheep have various characteristics that are very similar to people. We are extremely vulnerable, emotional, and easily frightened, and we need others. Considering the state of the world today, people are scared. And if they don't believe in Jesus, they should be. Even a spirit-filled believer who's walking in the light is sometimes only seeing the step in front of them and can very quickly step off the path and get caught up in the chaos, running from the scary sounds, crying out for the friend that we can't see. People are prone to failure and the bite of sin and thus easily succumb to death. I may have headed down a rabbit hole. So let's get back to the parable. I think it's important to consider who Jesus addressed the parable to. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them. So actually all three of these parables that we're going to deal with are addressed to the Pharisees and scribes directly. They were the religious leaders. Jesus points out that they would look for a sheep that was lost, but I believe it may go deeper than that. Jesus was attractive to lost people because he was a friend of sinners. He was a lamb because he was in fact like us. Hebrews 4 says, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched by the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, and yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And so was God sacrificed for us all. This parable gives a glimpse of how far God was willing to go to retrieve lost humanity. However, it also speaks to a population considered the bottom of the social class. For shepherds who were already shamed by profession, to have lost a sheep or a lamb would have brought further shame into his life. Is it possible that Jesus associated the murmuring Pharisees as shepherds in the parable as a slam to their shame-based culture? It is why they couldn't eat with publicans and sinners and the reason that they held such disdain for Jesus. It is also a picture of God who relentlessly pursues the lost, carries them back to safety and rejoices over the one and not the 99 who did not need to repent. Notice that heaven rejoices. Of course, this is one parable in a series of three. 
I believe each one approaches the notion of something lost, sought after, and found while supporting a larger whole picture of God's love. So, are you lost? Is there a void in your life that you can't seem to fill? May I tell you, Jesus is the answer. He is calling for you, seeking you out. Let him find you, and you won't regret it.